Good morning. We're going to have Chris Barr come up and give us a few announcements this morning. Amen. Hey, Scott's not here. He's gone up to see his dad in Michigan, so I get to do announcements. Yay! Um, Kids Club meeting, uh, 5 o'clock tonight for those that are uh, uh, going to help with Kids Club, so let's not forget that. Um, on the 25th, there's a planning meeting for uh, the movie night, and then the movie night is actually on the 30th, so that's exciting. Be praying about that and, uh, and be willing to come. We'll have a good time with that. And Kids Club will kick off on the 28th, so that's exciting. So uh, uh, keep that in mind and everybody remember that. Um, we, we, we talked to uh, Tuesday at the governing board meeting about uh, pastor's appreciation. We appreciate our pastor. In this COVID time, it's kind of hard to do. You know, traditionally we have like a dinner and we have a place with baskets and everybody can bring a card or whatever and say thank you to the pastors. And that's wonderful, but we really can't do it the same because of the COVID stuff. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have a pastor appreciation because we love our pastor and we're so grateful for him. Um, but we're going to roll it into a staff appreciation because they've been working hard and it's been hard. So um, just so you know all of who our staff is, Jason's going to throw up. We, obviously, you know, Pastor Ted and Sue, and we're just excited about them. And uh, uh, Scott, he's a... Uh, our youth guy, and uh, and uh, remember him, and we'll, we'll have a basket for him. And then Stacy is our church secretary. Uh, most of you know that, but not everybody knows Stacy, and, and she's church secretary. You need anything done? Anything. You can just bug her, put her to work. Yeah, it's my daughter. It's my daughter. Oh, uh, and then and then we got Megan. Megan. Uh, it, most of you don't know who Megan is because she's here cleaning when you're not here. She's, and she's doing a lot of work. She's coming in special after every service. She's cleaning and, and doing stuff, and she's working really hard. So let's not forget Megan. So we want a, a staff appreciation, obviously a pastor appreciation because we love our pastor. We never want him to think that we don't, uh, but it'll be kind of a staff appreciation. So for the next two weeks, we'll have baskets out there. Uh, one for each, uh, starting next week and for the next two weeks. And uh, we'll keep those together, and then we'll give them to them uh, in one shot. And uh, so remember that. So if you look in the bulletin, it says, uh, see Chris Parr if you have any questions. You now know everything I know. <laughs> but that's what we're going to try to do, and uh, we're just grateful to you guys. I know, I know we'll step up, and uh, we want our pastors to, be, to feel loved. Thank you. Amen. And, and uh, just so you know, uh, you know, we are celebrating birthdays, but I think it's Chris Barr's birthday today. Is it? No, not today. When is it? 21st. Okay. So just wish him a happy birthday and everybody else a happy birthday that you know is having a birthday. All right. Okay. Let's uh, just quiet our hearts before the Lord. We're going to worship him this morning, and it's a privilege that we can come together as children of the most high God, to worship him in spirit and in truth, and we're going to do that. So let's just take a few moments to quiet our hearts and to listen to him. the world.
that you came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing Show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, for you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you oh there's nothing There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn homes into armies. You turn better than knowing the Lord Jesus Christ and walking with him each and every day. Amen. 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 Would you pray with me? Yes. Oh Lord, what a beautiful message. There's nothing better than you. The God of the mountain is also the God of the valley. Father, we thank you that no matter our shortcomings, no matter how hard we try and still fail, God. You are there with grace and mercy to pick us up and to lift us up back again. Father, we thank you for loving us, for sending your son to die for us as a sacrifice for our sins. Father, there's nothing that we can do on our, by ourselves to reconcile ourselves to you. But Father, you filled that hole that we just cannot fill ourselves. God, we thank you so very much. Father, we thank you for all that's going on in the church. Thank you for uh, progress in being made with youth ministries and in the kids club. Father, just please bless all those ministries as the, as the kids especially are getting started to, or get about to get kicked off again. Father, we just ask for your protection and your blessing. Father, uh, 
during this time with the election coming up, Father, we just pray that your hand and your guidance and wisdom would be in this nation. Father, we know early voting is starting soon here in Florida. So, Father, protect voters, protect poll workers. And, Father, just give um, your wisdom. Father, we thank you for everything that you are going to give to us today, for your word. Father, help us to have a renewed passion for your word, to have it uh, just hidden in our hearts, that we would know you and who you are. So, Father, bless this day. In your precious name we pray. Amen. 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 It is wonderful to have you here. We're going to invite you to stand together and sing, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Let's stand together and sing praise to him. to share with everybody something about God's toolbox. And uh, there are um, servants of the Most High God who have discovered God's toolbox and who uses God's toolbox. And each one of us has been gifted with God's toolbox. If you are a believer in Christ, you have God's toolbox. Now, this is dangerous for a pastor to ask. Do you remember what the first tool was that I shared last week? Oh, oh, I got warm fuzzies all over. Yes, prayer. Prayer is a tool that God gives us that we can pray. You know, the Apostle Paul says we are to pray without ceasing. Pray continually to be in that communion with our Father every day. But now I've got another tool that God has given us, and it's a wonderful tool. And here it is. What is yes, very good. It is a picture of the Bible. What's another word for Bible? Holy Bible. Yes, it's a holy Bible, and it's God's Word, right? And there's some verses. It says, you have been taught, this is from 2 Timothy 3.15, you have been taught the holy scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. Another verse that you know, a little bit down, verse 16 of 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture that's God's Word, the Holy Bible. All Scripture is inspired by God, useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us 
when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God's Word. God's Word. We used to sing a song growing up called the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me, right? Bible. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Bible, that's right. Have you used this tool in your life? What you need to do is open it up every day. And what I pray is I say, Lord God, speak to me by the power of your Holy Spirit as I look into your word, the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, to teach me, to correct me, to challenge me, to make me more like Jesus. And then listen to what God is saying to you. And don't be afraid to take a a marker and mark it down or write down what God is saying. Because then throughout that day, you'll remember that verse as you're challenged to use God's tool. And you'll get to share it with someone else. And it's a wonderful tool that God has given us. A wonderful verse that says, what? I will hide God's word in my heart that I might not sin against him. Psalms. And so we are gifted by God to pray, and we're gifted by God to know his word, use his word, discover his word, become people of the word, people of the book, his book, God's word to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this tool. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us use it daily so that we can hear your word speak to us and be encouraged and grow in our walk with you. So we give you glory and we give you praise. Thank you for the Holy Scriptures. Open up our hearts today even. Open up our minds today, Lord, that we will hear from your Holy Spirit as you speak to us. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to invite you to stand together and let's sing a wonderful song of of, uh, praise, uh, 10,000 reasons. Let's stand together. Sing the song again. 
Lord Jesus, you make the woeful heart sing. Hallelujah. You heal the broken heart and make it whole. Glory. Lord, you heal the sin-sick body. Great physician, praise you. And Lord, we, your children, we exclaim together, you are more fairer. Oh, Lamb of God, who was slain, who is standing in the throne of heaven, you are glorious. You are victorious. You are our champion, our conqueror, our coming king, and we worship you this day. So may our eyes be filled with the beauty of Jesus. May our ears hear only the words of Christ today. So open our hearts and our minds, O Lord. May the Spirit speak to us. And may your body be strengthened, O God. Do your work your way in our midst for your glory. This we ask in Jesus' wonderful, beautiful, glorious name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And uh, as we're being seated, uh, the children can be dismissed for Children's Church. And uh, at this time, we're going to also show a little video from uh, one of our college students who is away, and uh, she is at Tacoa Falls College, Grace Mudge, and she is going to ask us as a congregation for a little help. And so she's going to explain that, and then, uh, then we'll continue on. So go ahead, Jason, show that if you can. Uh, first and foremost, I would really like to thank Pastor Ted, pastoral staff, and the governing board for just giving me the opportunity to speak to you guys this morning about a pretty big project that I have this semester. Um, currently, I'm taking a class called Church Health, where we are studying what makes a healthy church and how to measure the health of a church. Uh, with that being said, the project is just an overview of that class, and what I need your help with is something called a church survey. So I have written out a survey and gotten it approved by Pastor Ted. And so at the end of the service, you will be receiving my survey. And I really hope that you would be willing to help me out by just filling it out and returning it back to the church office by next Sunday so that they can ship me all of the results and I can get that project done. Um, I just want to remind you, there's no wrong answers. This is not a reflection on you. We just want to see how you feel about certain aspects of the church. Um, so if you could just go ahead and turn that in by next Sunday, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Now, she speaks as fast as her dad. <laughs> Did you catch that? She was like zooming through that. So just to translate a little slower, um, Grace is a student at Tacoa Falls College. She's taking a church growth health class and uh, where they are supposed to study a church. Guess what church she picked? <laughs> You're right, see? She picked our church. And so she's asked for a survey to be done, as well as the demographics of our church and the history of our church. And this church has a wonderful history. It really does, and we're thankful for that. And uh, so she compiled 25 questions don't be scared. And uh, she said, no wrong answers. And you get to circle it. Now, there is a reason why I didn't hand it out now. Can you guess? I didn't want you to fill it out while we're preaching from the Word of God. Okay? This is not to be a distraction, but a tool to help us. So at the end of the service, uh, we'll hand those out, encourage you to fill them out, and then bring them back next Sunday. We'll give them to Grace. Then Grace is going to compile all the data, and she's supposed to report back to us. And, and we'll share with you all the wonderful findings <laughs> of that survey. I can hardly wait. <laughs> yeah. Just, I'll, I'll give you a cute clue here. Okay, first question. Church has a written mission statement that is communicated well in a variety of ways. And then you're supposed to circle strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, strongly agree. 
Okay, don't talk to me about it now. <laughs> there are many things we could say, right? And we'll each have one. Oh, this is what I think. So you just put that out. So I'm looking forward to the answers. It's great. Okay. If you have your Bibles, we invite you to take them and turn with me to the last book in the Bible. We have been traveling together in this wonderful revelation from God's Word. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is from Jesus, about Jesus, for the people who follow Jesus, and Jesus in his love encourages his beloved disciple John, who's exiled on the island of Patmos, and he gives him this message for the church, especially for the churches of John's day, but also for the church today. And so uh, John faithfully sees the vision. He hears the word of the Lord, and he records it. And in fact, chapter 1 tells us that those who hear this letter those who read this letter, there's a blessing from God that takes place, and it should not be neglected. It should be read. Well, we've traveled together through this wonderful uh, book. The first chapter really is a picture of Jesus and who he is. Chapters 2 and 3 really reflect the seven churches and what they were going through. And we could read all those and say, "Uh uh-huh, that's a little bit of us and you know, the church today, uh uh-huh, I see a little bit of that. And then we got to say, oh, Lord, help us. Move us to repent and remove the sin from us and help us to really look to Jesus and fix our eyes on him, the author and finisher of our faith. And then from chapter 4 through till uh, about um, 19 or so is really uh, several visions that take place about what is going to take place in Revelation. And we are now kind of in the thick of things, but sort of toward uh, the middle in Revelation 14. And we're at a pause. We're at a pause. It's, in other words, it's kind of a, uh, let's take a break. Okay, let's take a step back. Here's the big picture God gives us. And I just, and, and John, you're supposed to write this down. I want you to see it. I want you to be encouraged by it. I want you to share it. And that's kind of where we are. So follow along as we read, we'll read this uh, together and then refer back. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb standing in Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his Father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps, And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. They followed the Lamb wherever He goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as firstfruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless." Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and the springs of water. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, uh, the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, 
They will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called out in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horses' bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. Let's pray. Father, as we look into your word this morning, we pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you will illumine our hearts and our minds and our eyes and our ears that we will hear what you have for us. Oh God, may we just gather as your people and hear your word in such a way that you speak to us intimately, yes. You speak to us corporately, yes. But you also speak to us in such a way that we are overwhelmed with your holiness. We're overwhelmed with your victory. We're overwhelmed that you love us with an everlasting love and you are longing to rescue those who are perishing. So, Father, move into our hearts. Speak to us, we pray, and give us the courage to respond and obey, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we look into this passage of Scripture this morning, it is wonderful that we can gather together because when we gather together as people who are called by God's name and we come before him in humility and we come to seek his face, we come just as we are in our brokenness, we come willing, I hope you come wanting to turn if anything that God has pointed out in your life and to confess it, to turn from our wicked ways. God promises he hears our prayer, he forgives our sins, and he heals our land. If there is ever a time in history that we need God to hear his people pray, it is today, it is now. If there is ever a time in history that we need God to forgive us of our sins, It is today, it is now. If ever there is a time when we need God to come and move in our land in such a mighty way and heal our land, it is today. Amen? Wouldn't you agree? We need to cry out, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy on me. But just for a moment, if you could put on your imaginary thinking hat and take your imaginary glasses and put them on, and imagine with me for just a moment, faith vision glasses, you have them on, and you're imagining that God, by His Holy Spirit, for His glory and honor, that there are people everywhere lifting up the name above every name, and showing Christ and people everywhere from every tribe and every nation, whether they're on the county road or on the city street or in the grassy field or on the lakeside, if they're by the ocean view or on the mountain peak, everyone everywhere sees Jesus Christ. Imagine that. Imagine. Not the Beatles song. I can only imagine... But like mercy me, I can only imagine what heaven's going to be like. But I can imagine, can you imagine for a moment if everyone could see Jesus? See him as he is. In all his glory. To see him and to see God move by the breath of his mighty spirit. To convict the world of sin. And then all people, can you see it? All people repent. Wow. 
God cleanses people's hearts, forgives them of their sin. People respond with a great revival. A great awakening takes place. God brings healing in our land. He heals the broken. He heals the sick. He heals the fallen away. He rescues the prodigal. He rescues the runaways. He redeems the down and outs. He saves. Just think, you see people genuinely loving one another, loving each other, asking forgiveness, showing care, showing concern, showing compassion. You see individuals more concerned and loving others than their own needs than, or their own desires or their own opinions to be expressed. You see people helping other people in the midst of all this is such a joy, such a love, such a peace that permeates everywhere and it's not a fairy tale. It's not a wish list thing. It is reality. It is the kingdom of God and the king of kings in the center of his people. The tears have been dried the sorrow turned to laughter, and the mourning's now in dancing. And could this be, you say? I pray that there will be a day like this in your lifetime and in my lifetime, a great awakening, a great revival. But I know this. There is coming a day, there is coming a day when Jesus will stand triumphant on his throne victorious over all, gathered around him are those who have put their faith and trust in him as Savior and Lord, and they're experiencing victory. He is reigning. He is being worshipped. All the inhabitants of heaven and earth fear him and give him glory. In fact, we can catch a glimpse of this in chapter 14. Did you see it? In this chapter, which is a pause, we see before the final judgments are unleashed, John reveals this vision. He's privy to it, and he sees it, and he writes it. In verse 1, verse 6, and verse 14, John looked, John saw, John looked again, and he even instructed to write a specific blessing in verse 13. What is the Lord God Almighty wanting to say to his people? What is the exact representation of his being who is Jesus Christ? What is he wanting to say to his people? What is the Holy Spirit who instructs us and teaches us all things about Jesus wanting to say to his people? What is God wanting to say from his word? Mm. First, I believe that God is wanting to say he has an army that is triumphant. An army that is triumphant. Did you notice it? In verse 1 he says, Then I looked and there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Wow. Who is this lamb? It is Jesus Christ. What is taking place? The 144,000, those special ambassadors and uh, Jewish believers who have received the seal of Christ, not only in their heart, and every believer who has put their faith in Jesus Christ has the Holy Spirit seal in their life. Wow, that's great stuff. And no one, no one, no earthly system, not even the devil himself can break that seal. We've been sealed with Almighty God's Holy Son, the seal of the Spirit upon our heart and life. And we are His. And here Jesus is standing on the throne victorious and gathered around Him. He is triumphant. And here is an army that is triumphant. They are on Mount Zion victorious. The dragon and the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth, which chapter 13 refers to, has been defeated. That's the devil, the antichrist, and the false prophet. They have been crushed by Christ, the lamb. Hallelujah. And he is standing victoriously on Mount Zion here. Mount Zion is the picture of the city of God, the presence of God Almighty. It is his place of victory. And Christ shows John that even though the world will go through tribulation, those who reject Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, those who refuse Him as the Messiah, those who reject God's love to them, they will experience defeat. And John, the Lord says, I want you to know, I want you to see that I have an army that is triumphant. Wow. Often we as believers, followers of Jesus, 
on this side of the tribulation? We easily agree, don't we? God wins. I've read the last word. God wins. We know that Christ is victorious, but oftentimes in our day-to-day -day living, we live otherwise. We live and go through our days struggling, discouraged, and even defeated. Some of us may even be at that point of this this morning. I'm just existing. I'm in the humdrum living mode. I'm going through the motions. Some of us may even be at the point of giving up, saying, what's the use? Don't you see, you may say to me, don't you see, Pastor Ted, that we're living in a pandemic don't you know that's, that's going on? Don't you see? It's hard. It's so hard. It's hard to grow old. Don't you see? I can't be with my friends at school anymore. Don't you see? I got to wear this mask. I don't like masks. Don't you see? And I would say this. Don't you see, child of God, that God has an army waiting and willing to help you right now, right this moment? Yes, he does. You say, I don't know. I say, yes, he does. Elijah. There's a story about Elijah and his servant. Elijah was a prophet of God, and he, the king of Aram, was furious with Elijah, wanted to capture Elijah because Elijah told the king of Israel everything the king of Aram was planning because God told Elijah. And so Elijah went and told the king of Israel, and this made the king of Aram furious. So the king of Aram sent out an army to capture Elijah. Elijah's servant looks to the hills and sees the army coming. He's filled with fear, but Elijah isn't. Elijah knew that God was with him and that God's army surrounded him and that God would protect him through the danger. Notice what happens. The story is in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8 through 23, but notice 16 and 17. And here the verses are. Here it says, So... Elijah answered, and he says to his servant, he says, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Did you hear that? Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elijah prayed and said, O oh Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. The Lord is with his people. The Lord is with us more than he is with them. God is with us. God is in the business of protecting his children, his servants, who are called by his name. He's wanting us to have our eyes wide open and see the army of God. Wanting to help us. He's waiting to help us, especially in our time of need. God helps because we are his namesake. We are called by his name. He doesn't help us to exalt man. He doesn't help us to exalt us. He helps us because of his love and mercy to demonstrate his power, his glory, and his righteousness. John sees the army here in Revelation 14.1. We even know about that army if you turn over to chapter 17 in verse 14. It says, These will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them because He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with Him are, called, are the called and the chosen and the faithful. The Lamb, Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Who's with Him? The called, the chosen, the faithful. Chapter 19 of Revelation, in verse 14, it says this. In chapter 19, verse 14 of Revelation, notice what it says there. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. Did you hear that? There's an army in heaven. The armies in heaven. They are following the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this moment, they are descending and they're following him on white horses. God is letting you and I know that he has an army and that we who are his children, who follow Jesus Christ, we are in this part of scripture at this point, I believe we're part of his army and we're with him. We're part of God's army. If you've trusted in Christ, you are a soldier of God's army. And you say, well, I don't really want to be 
in the army. God says, you are a soldier. We are to put on the whole armor of God. We're to stand our ground. We're to fight the good fight of faith. As the hymn writer wrote, Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? Shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? Must I be carried to skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the flood? Is this vile world a friend of grace to help me on to God? Sure, I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by thy word. Thy saints in all this glorious war shall conquer, though they die. They see the triumph from afar by faith's discerning eye. When that illustrious day shall rise, and all thy armies shine in robes of victory through the skies, the glory shall be thine. Isaac Watts penned that hymn in 1721, but the truth remains reflected in Revelation. All for Jesus. All for Jesus. Notice back in Revelation 14, verse 2 now. We see that there's a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and a loud peal of thunder. He goes on and states that what he heard was like the, that of harpists playing their harps. Yes, I would have loved it to be uh, guitarists playing their guitars. Or if you're a pianist, a pianist who's playing their piano. Or an organist who's playing the organ. But no, there's harps. <laughs> a harpist playing their harps. It's a loud sound. And in verse 3 it says that they are, this army sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song. It wasn't because it was syncopated. It wasn't because it had a rough meter. It wasn't because it was an unfamiliar song, though. <laughs> Might have been. But they couldn't, not everyone could sing that song. Why? Because it was a special song to be sung by those who were undefiled. In other words, it was the 144,000 Jewish believers who were Christ's faithful witness and proclaimer of the gospel. They were singing it. It was those who did not defile themselves. In other words, they kept themselves pure, holy. They did not fall away from the faith. They remained true and faithful, unadulterated, committed, undivided, totally devoted. They followed the Lamb, serving Him. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. They were able to walk a spirit-filled, spirit-led life, walking during the tribulation. They did not take the mark of the beast. They received the mark of God, and they stayed true. And for those whom they shared the gospel, to those who believed in Christ, those who gave their life for their love of Jesus, they were martyred, but they found life in Jesus everlasting for all eternity. You might say, well, is it worth it to follow Jesus? Is it worth it? Yes, it is. You might say, well, why not just give into the world? Why not just take the shortcut? Why not just say the dishonest thing? The enemy says that. No one will know. Maybe you might have everybody fooled if you do this, but you do not have God fooled. He sees what no man can see. He sees, God sees our heart. He's Love is persistent. His love is pursuing you to come to him, to trust him, yet he is patient. And there is coming a day when God's patient will run out, when he raptures his church and the tribulation will begin. Yet in his mercy there will still be an opportunity to receive the gospel, believe in the Lord Jesus from the witness of the 144,000. But the attraction of this world system, the desire and pressure to have goods and to sell goods, to survive will be so great to receive the mark of the beast. It, if you refuse it, it will cost you your life. And during those days of following Jesus, you will lose your life for him. But know this, that those who believe in Jesus Christ have everlasting life. Those who do not have the Son of God do not have everlasting life. That's 1 John 5, 12. So coming back to this new song of praise and worship that the 144,000 sing, those who were pure and did not defile themselves, it was loud, like that of rushing waters and thunder. And then in verse 6, John says, another angel's flying around. 
proclaiming an eternal gospel to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. The gospel will be proclaimed. The vision that you and I had with those imaginary glasses on, seeing people come to the Lord, it will take place. There will be a mighty, mighty revival, I believe. And here's what that angel says in verse 7. Notice it says, fear God and give him glory or give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Fear God. Give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth and sea and springs of living water. God wants you to see that there is an army triumphant. And we are part of that army. But he wants you to see as well that there's judgment coming, the arrival of judgment in verse 6 and 7. Some people have said because of verse 6, evangelism, proclaiming the gospel to every tribe and tongue and nation really doesn't does not rely on the church's ability to do so. It's not that necessary. You don't have to do that. Because this angel here in Revelation is going to do it. So I don't need to be concerned about people who don't know the Lord because this angel is going to proclaim it. Those who hold to this view miss what the Lord desires for his disciples to make disciples. Matthew 18 Uh, 28 in verses 18 through 20 tells us, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, or as you are going, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And much of this centers around Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. I believe it's not an either-or statement, it's a both-and. We as the church need to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ now to those around us so that they will hear the good news, turn from their wicked ways, give their life to God, become a follower of Jesus, hallelujah, discover the joy that he gives. There's no greater joy than to know that you are walking with the Creator God in right relationship with him, and your sins have been forgiven, and your sins have been removed, and you are cleansed vessel of the Lord there's no greater joy than knowing that that your heart is made right with God man that's good news the Lord forgives me all my past all my present all my future I don't go and sin intentionally more because I can just put it and throw it in God's face no I come before him thankful broke and humble and yet he fills me with his spirit he fills me with his love he fills me with his son and he knows that I am his and he is mine hallelujah and I'm clean before him If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe the reason that the world is facing so much chaos today is because we have forgotten that there's an army waiting to help us, to give us victory in the day-to-day challenges of life. So when I feel that it is tough for me to grow old, I can rely on the Lord's strength to help me be strong. And if I feel that I am weak and weary and worn out and sick and filled with infirmary, I can gather the children of God around me and the elders of the church to pray over me and I can ask the Holy Spirit of God who made me in His image to be like Him, to do that miraculous work in me and through me and He will heal me. If not, He will receive all the praise, all the glory, all the honor forever and ever. Glory to His name because He's rescued me from the kingdom of darkness and brought me into the kingdom of light and that's the living reality what we see today is not the reality it's a preparation ground for all eternity for those who love Christ will be in his presence forever in heaven and those who reject him will be in the eternal torment for heaven not in heaven but in hell So the question this morning is, not even getting to my third point, 
Man, I got fired up. I didn't even have, didn't even have two cups of coffee. Wow, thank you, Jesus. The good news about all this is, if it's both and, that the gospel is going to be proclaimed and is being proclaimed around the entire world. Hallelujah. It's amazing to me when I read reports that a village in Cambodia, that they start new churches. 20 churches are started during the pandemic in Cambodia. We don't hear about that. But God's spirit is moving. He's working. The gospel is being proclaimed throughout the world. And when God's time is fully reached, then the end will come. It's like being at your favorite sporting event, watching the game. The Lightning won. Or who won last night in the baseball? The Rays won. You didn't have to wait on the newscaster to tell you that. If you were watching the game, they knew it. And you knew it, but because you knew it, you went and told somebody else. You didn't have to wait on that because it was good news to you. You were so excited about it. The Rays won, man. They're going to the World Series. Can't you believe it? It's great news. Guess what? Jesus saves. That's great news. And because that's great news, I don't need to wait till the end comes. I don't need to wait on a newscaster. I can go tell somebody else. Just believe in him and receive him in your life. It is a decisive moment that changes your life and direction and all you need to do is trust him today because that is what he's done for me hallelujah it's good news and I need to tell everyone about that good news wow so what does that mean for us this morning let me jump ahead here what does it mean for us C.S. Lewis said this big words C.S. Lewis said that God will invade, but I wonder whether people who ask God to interfere openly and directly in our world quite realize what it will be like when he does. When that happens, it is the end of the world. When the author walks into the stage, the play is over. God is going to invade, all right, but what is the good of saying you are on his side then when you see the whole natural universe melting away like a dream and something else? Something that never entered your head to conceive comes crashing in. Something so beautiful to some of us and so terrible to others that none of us will have any choice left. For this time it will be God without disguise. Something so overwhelming that it will strike either irresistible love or irresistible horror into every creature. It will be too late then to choose your side. In the 1800s, there was this man by the name of uh, Charles Blondin, and he passed away in 1897. You might have heard of him. Uh, he was uh, born Jean-Francois Gravelette Blondin, gained notoriety for crossing the Niagara Falls on several occasions. Some of the things he would do, he crossed Ni the Niagara Falls on a tightrope uh, with a wheelbarrow. One time he used stilts. On one occasion he camped out halfway across and he cooked himself an omelet. The acrobat rightfully earned his reputation as a courageous daredevil. However, this picture is a picture of him and his manager. His manager is Harry Colcord. Harry Colcord here demonstrated another kind of courage. On one of Blondin's many crossings, Colcord, who was no type rope walker himself, rode across on Blondin's back. That kind of courage can only be exercised when we place our total trust in someone else's capabilities. Are you trusting in Jesus Christ this morning? Are you trusting in his capability? Are you trusting that he is the leader of the triumphant army? Are you trusting that he is willing and waiting and wanting to help you wherever you are right now? Are you trusting in him for salvation? Are you trusting in the Lord? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word to our heart. We are challenged today by the message of your word. It is a, 
a glorious word because we know that with Christ we gain the victory. Even though we may not be experiencing victory right now, we gain the victory. And Lord, for those who have never put their faith and trust in you as Savior and Lord, I pray that they will do so today, right now, this moment. There's no magic in a prayer. There's no magic in a saying. But there is a way to describe the desire of your heart and soul and life. And just pray to the Lord in your own words even. Lord Jesus, I come to you. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. I want to follow you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Even that simple. The word says that if we confess with our mouth that Christ is Lord and believe that Christ has been risen from the dead, we will be saved. So, Lord, we thank you for that promise of salvation. And if there's anyone here this morning that has not prayed that prayer or has not made that decision, that they'll make that decision today. And then, Father, for us who are your children, who are walking, Lord, we ask that you'll give us that ability to walk in the Spirit and be Spirit-led so we won't be defiled by the world. Lord, that you will give us that energy to even if we're in that humdrum state of being, Lord, that we will wake up and rely upon you as our victory, rely upon you as our strength, rely upon you as our healer, Rely upon you as our Lord, as King of kings and Lord of lords. Rely upon you as our creator. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Rely upon you totally by trusting in you, no matter the circumstance. So, Lord, I pray that we who are in that spot will do that. And, brother and sister, if you are in that spot, take a moment and come to Jesus. Come back to Jesus. Tell him all about it. He knows. He can hear. He listens. And he is longing to help. Father, we thank you that you are on the throne, that you reign victorious. We thank you for the hope that is ours in Christ Jesus. We thank you for the rest that you give us. We are looking forward to the days of revival and refreshing even in these turbulent times, Lord, we know that you are sovereign and are on the throne and are in control. Thank you, Lord God, that you make a way when there seems to be no way. So we praise you today, and Lord, we respond in singing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to invite you to stand and sing in response uh, the Waymaker. Let's stand together.
Isn't it good to know that God's the way maker? Amen. Amen. Blessed be his name. Before we pray and dismiss, make sure we're going to ask Bill if Bill would grab some of the surveys. They're already out there. So make sure that you grab one of Grace's surveys from Lou on, the, on this door and going out the other door. All right. Make sure that you fill that out. Bring it back next week. No wrong answer. All right. Trust in him. Trust in him. Trust in him. He will never fail you. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you make a way even when there seems to be no way. (laughs) Even as the song says, Lord, you work in ways we cannot see. You will make a way for all of us. So we trust in you. So, Lord, come and have your way. Continue as we go from this place to go before us. May we shine for you. And may you receive all the glory, all the praise and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. It was...